everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories. I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Welcome back. Hope you're having a nice day. In this Chats with Shauna episode, I'm going to reflect on various aspects of U.S. culture. Although I talk about culture all the time, it's not often we talk about some basic things, like everyday life things. And the truth is, I don't often think about the topics I'm going to discuss today. They're pretty random. We're currently in Brazil, and I don't know about you, but there's something about being in a foreign country where life and people are different that forces you to reflect on who you are. Sometimes it's simple things, like preferences. I crave a big cup of coffee in the morning, probably because I grew up in a country where that's the standard. Our portion sizes and just the sizes of our drinks are pretty big. After many years drinking it that way, it's hard for me to get used to small, concentrated cups of coffee that are common in other countries. They taste great, but it's a little frustrating that I take two sips and they're gone. If you've lived or spent a significant period of time in a foreign country, you probably also know it forces you to reflect on more profound things, like how people think differently or interact with each other differently. For example, in Brazil, people are absurdly nice, genuinely enthusiastic about things, to the point I have to ask myself, does my facial expression match the energy level? Have you guys done this in the United States? Have you thought about this? <laughs> Through your experiences, do you find that people are warm and welcoming, cold, or somewhere in the middle? If this is your first time listening to a Chats with Shauna episode, know that this is spontaneous. The goal for you is to hear natural transitions from one idea to the next. I'll explain challenging words and phrases as I go along. If you would like the transcript, ad-free audio, quiz, and other bonus material that goes along with this episode, be sure to sign up to Season 4 at AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Before we begin, I do need to give a big thanks to all of you who sent me letters and postcards to my P.O. box after listening to episode number 163 about the post office and sending mail. It's been really exciting to hear some of your stories and seeing that handwriting really shows me you do exist, and that's amazing. When we get back from our trip abroad, I'll check that mailbox once again. So if you haven't already uh, sent me a letter and you want to, be sure to check out episode 163 you will find the address as well as all of the information about how to send letters to the U.S. Let's begin today's episode. Be sure to stay tuned until the very end where I'll mention one very specific and kind of funny cultural difference that most foreigners don't like in the United States and also people born and raised in the U.S. don't like. Stay tuned for that. As you probably know by now, Lucas, uh, my husband, is a music producer. He creates pop music in L.A., Latin music in Miami, country music in Nashville. He's all over the place. But when we're in Brazil, he works on a genre that doesn't exist outside of Brazil. It's called Sertanejo, and essentially it's Brazilian country music. Last week, his client asked him to come to Brazil for an urgent project. 
Now we're here. Pretty spontaneous, right? I am currently in an Airbnb in the outskirts of Sao Paulo. And there's a ton of activity outside. I can currently hear motorcycles zooming by. Uh, You might hear an occasional car horn. You might hear some helicopters or airplanes overhead. It's sort of loud, but it's busy and it's exciting. And it's kind of where I've gotten a lot of the ideas for today's lesson. So even though Lucas and I lived in Brazil together from 2016 to 2018, this week was filled with firsts. It was the first time I drove in Brazil. It was the first time I enrolled my daughters in a school in a foreign country. They're in a full Portuguese immersion program at the moment. And it was the first time that I decided to give in to some beauty treatments, which has been fun and different. And it's, once again, the inspiration for today's lesson. So let's start with beauty. As we say in English, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That means that beauty is subjective. What one person finds beautiful or attractive may not be perceived the same way by others. People have different preferences. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Of course, there are trends in beauty. I'm not blind. (laughs) Then again, I'm not the right person to talk about style. I'm sort of out of it at the moment. But what I've noticed is that in some countries, less is more. For example, while in France, I had the impression that women strive to look natural and wear little makeup or maybe neutral makeup. So neutral tones, like skin color tones. While at the same time wearing high quality perfume and nice clothes. And as a result, they look natural and effortless, but in a good way, right? So less is more. How about in your country? Do people tend to wear heavy makeup or light makeup? It probably varies from person to person and place to place, as it does in the United States, and probably in France too. I do think that in the U.S., we aren't as proactive about maintaining our appearance as in some Latin American countries. For most people, I think, um, the salon is a place to go to every now and then. In Brazil, on the other hand, many women go to the salon once a week to get their nails done. In fact, many salons sell manicure and pedicure packages, which was new for me. I actually bought four manicures and two pedicures for about 50 to 60 US dollars, which is great because it's the same as one manicure and one pedicure back in the States. So in your opinion, do you think that women in the U.S. put themselves together? When I say that someone is put together, it means that they fix their hair, they get ready, they look good, they are put together. If you want to use this as a verb, you'd say, the women put themselves together. In Brazil, many women put themselves together. They get ready. They're not a mess. Lucas, because he's got this foreign perspective in the United States, often comments on how messy (laughs) we look. And I don't blame him. I see it too. A lot of people are just okay with what they've got. Like, this is my hair. It's a bit dirty today. I'll throw it in a bun and it'll be fine. Or, hmm, my nails look bad. I'll just paint them with a bottle of nail polish I have in the drawer. Problem solved. Outside of big cities in the United States, I rarely feel pressure to dress up or to put myself together. I do think there is a societal expectation to look decent in Brazil. Like I said, salons are more common. And this trip, I've decided to renovate myself. (laughs) So this week, I got my hair done. I'm going to get my eyebrows done, my nails done. 
and maybe even get a facial, which is so exciting. Do you think people from the United States care about their appearance? Do you think people care more in big cities? What about in your country? That brings me to the second topic. This week, I went to the grocery store and I bought many things that I have a hard time finding back home. One being big green avocados. I know that you can get the big ones in Florida, but in other states, they are hard to find. Exotic fruit, which I love. Boxed milk, so the milk that you can find in the Tetra Pak that sits on the shelf, that has a very long shelf life. And then unrefrigerated eggs. This is the second cultural difference I wanted to mention. Your eggs might stay outside of the fridge. In the U.S., you have to put them inside. While growing up, my mom warned my family about foodborne illnesses. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, was sort of the source of her commentary. As you probably know, the FDA guides the general public in the U.S. about food and drug safety. And that includes tips on how to store perishable food. Perishable food is food that has a short shelf life. In other words, if left on the shelf, it will spoil or it will go bad fast. So here's the recommendation for perishable food. And this is by the FDA, by the way. We should, quote, never allow meat, poultry. Poultry is basically chicken or turkey, birds that people eat. Seafood, eggs, or other produce or food that require refrigeration to sit at room temperature for more than two hours or just one hour if the temperature is over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty specific, right? I grew up with the government telling me eggs need to be refrigerated. When I traveled abroad for the first time, a wave of panic swept over me when I saw eggs sitting out of the fridge at the supermarket. At the time, I was unaware that many, many countries do this. So why does the U.S. government tell us to put our eggs in the fridge while others don't? A long time ago, I looked this up, and the answer is sort of weird. Did you know that eggs have a natural protective coating on the outside that prevents them from getting bacteria inside, like salmonella? This is why many countries leave their eggs outside of the fridge. Each egg has a little protective jacket on it. In the United States, and according to the USDA in Canada, Japan, and Scandinavia, eggs get washed before they go in the carton. And that washing process removes debris, dirt, and that natural protective coating on the eggshell. So after washing, bacteria has a higher chance of entering the egg if it's left at room temperature or above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Crazy, right? I know. Why in the world would the FDA have egg companies remove the egg's protective jacket, making it necessary to refrigerate them? They say it's for safety reasons. The point of this is just make sure when you are in the U.S. to put your eggs in the fridge when you're abroad, you can do whatever your country does, but don't want you guys to get salmonella in the U.S. Number three, Americans are bad drivers when we are in foreign countries. Um, this is a strong statement, and I'm going to try and back it up. So back in the 1950s, we had this president, President Eisenhower. Um, people called him Ike. Anyway, Ike was in Germany during World War II, and he saw how effective the Autobahn was. Autobahn is essentially a German highway. I'm not sure if it exists in other countries there, but 
The Audubon is a highway. So when he came back to the United States and became president, he decided to create an interstate system in the U.S., loosely based on Germany's model. He wanted highways to connect all of the U.S. states to promote interstate commerce and travel from one area to the next. So he was like, let's create 41,000 miles of highways. Crazy project. It was crazy, but he did it. At the time, a lot of the land in the United States was undeveloped. Highways could be long, straight, wide. So the U.S. became a country whose infrastructure was built for cars and trucks. So much thought went into how to make driving in the U.S. extremely easy, from the physical roads to the signs, even the numbering system. Did you guys know that all highways from east to west are even numbers? From north to south, odd numbers? I mean, you can drive all the way from California to Florida on Highway 10. Same goes for 40, I know, and then 80. Same sort of thing as you go northward. So also our exits are labeled with numbers and letters so that even if you lose access to GPS, you can get from point A to point B fairly well by knowing your exit. Other than pedestrians that might run across the street at any moment, remember they have the right of way in the U.S., they have the priority. I think we have fewer distractions on the road than a lot of other countries. Of course, this is a biased opinion, but let me explain. First of all, there are fewer people riding bicycles. I don't often see people riding bikes to work or to school. It's not really the norm in most places. Um, There are fewer motorcycles and Vespas on the road. I know that a lot of the world relies on scooters and motorcycles and Vespas, but they're not as common as a main method of transportation. As I mentioned, cars are. We also have less public transportation to work around. So I wish there were more trams and cable cars and metro systems, but a lot of these cities haven't mastered uh, public transportation. So we don't have any of those distractions on the road. And to top it off, I've spent time in 20 U.S. states, and I feel from this experience that we have much fewer roundabouts than a lot of places I've been to outside of the U.S. And I do think that because you need to yield because you need to pay attention really closely to not hit other cars, it does make driving a tad bit more difficult. These challenges on the road, from bikes to motorcycles to regular public transportation, like buses and trams and roundabouts, is why I think you are all better at driving than we are, if that makes sense. So this brings me back to Brazil. It is incredibly chaotic on the roads here, but organized chaos. There are so many things happening in my line of vision, from motorcycles to lanes disappearing to sudden speed bumps, roundabouts with three lanes. Everyone understands what's happening except me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. (laughs) Oh my God, imagine if that was what Taylor Swift was really singing about, her (laughs) poor driving skills in foreign countries. Oh, I truly, from the bottom of my heart, think you should be afraid of us when we're driving in your country. Be careful. Number four, we're obsessed with refrigeration and cold air in general. I was not aware of this growing up. When I moved back to the United States after a year abroad in Berlin, I went to the movies with my friends. It was summertime in California, and it was one of those hot days, the sort of dry heat that makes you feel like you're an egg sizzling in a frying pan. The inside of the movie theater, on the other hand, was freezing. Not to be dramatic, but the temperature change 
from outside to inside was so alarming that I had an immediate case of reverse culture shock. Have you heard that term before? Reverse culture shock is the psychological and emotional distress that you experience when returning home from an extended period of time abroad. It's a bizarre feeling. Sometimes you become overly critical about things that you grew up with. The movie theater, for me, was ice cold. The grocery store felt too cold. Everywhere felt overly air-conditioned, like we were in Antarctica. We just like air conditioning too much. This is why we always have a jacket, even in summertime. I was trying to figure out what the last point of this very random episode would be, and a lot of different cultural aspects came to mind. When I used to regularly teach English classes, of course, I don't as often anymore because I've got my two little girls to take care of. But when I used to, students used to tell me things that surprised me at first, things that I'd never thought of. For example, the amount of flags. When you came to the United States, did it feel like we have more flags than people raise in your country? I actually found a comment on it. It was posted by someone on Reddit. I will link the page, by the way, in the episode notes. And here it is. Not really a shock, but one thing that really surprised me was the sheer amount of flags. It was like almost every building had an American flag. Here in Belgium, if I see a house with a national flag, I assume there's some kind of sport event going on that I didn't know about. So um, it should be sporting event, I-N-G at the end. Do people raise flags in your country? Is it just for sporting events? Is it for national holidays? Another comment was, everything is huge. Road lanes, groceries, soda sizes. The fact that you guys um, have such a big country that it might take 11 hours to drive from one uh, state to the next. Others said tipping is crazy in the U.S. The fact that it's so high. Others mentioned ads for medicine on television. Do you guys have ads for medicine on TV? Anyway, I would love to know what else you found peculiar while in the U.S., some maybe aspects of culture shock. I won't take any offense to anything you say. I'm open-minded. Let me know what you think. You can write to me on Instagram at American English Podcast or on Spotify. Which brings me to my last point, the one thing that pretty much nobody likes in the United States including Americans. Number five, our bathroom stalls. When you go into public restrooms, anywhere, at least if there's multiple toilets, <laughs> there are bathroom stalls. Each stall is a little room with three walls and a door. Inside is a toilet, toilet paper, etc. Public restrooms might have many bathroom stalls. They're supposed to give privacy to whoever is using the toilet. The thing is, in the United States, they're not very private. Most stalls have a big empty space on the bottom, so from the floor, maybe up about a foot and a half, so that people can see the bottom of your legs, so maybe your ankles and your feet. And there's also a crack down both sides vertically so that if you look or you try to look inside, you can actually make eye contact with the person who is sitting on the toilet. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've heard comments on this. As far as I'm aware, not many people like it. Foreigners and people who were born and raised here. We all want more privacy in the bathroom. In fact, while abroad, my friends commented, wow, bathrooms in Europe are so nice. You really have some privacy. On the other hand, while a lot of people dislike it, there are some people who are indifferent. 
indifferent means you don't care either way. One Reddit user said, I've never cared about the gap. It makes it easy to see if the stall is occupied. It's not like people sit there staring at you through the gap. (laughs) Kind of funny input. But what I found most entertaining is the amount of people that try to justify why our bathroom stalls are designed with such huge gaps. Because there is not one answer. Some say the gaps discourage people from having SEX or doing drugs inside. Since everyone can see, if they want to, it's less likely overdoses will happen. Another theory is that the gaps help janitors clean the stalls quicker. They can just reach their mop underneath, clean, and walk away. What do you think? I know a lot of areas in Europe have attendants in the bathroom. Do you think this is a solution or a better solution for the issues at hand? Maybe you guys can bring this topic to your English class. It's random, but I'm certain there are going to be some funny answers. My favorite comment on Reddit had a lot of swear words in it, so I'll paraphrase. The fact that there are gaps to prevent drug use is a misguided rumor from people who don't know anything. Our bathroom stalls in the U.S. are cheap. That is the only reason there are these massive gaps. So, I don't know. I guess the debate will continue. I just kind of wanted to point out that there is a discussion about that gap. Maybe you've noticed it. Maybe you haven't. Maybe it's not important at all. But there was some interesting vocab in there, right? (laughs) That's it for today's episode. We'll be in Brazil for the next month, which is so exciting. I'm planning on going to the store this week to buy a, a lot of different exotic fruit to try. Maybe it'll inspire some new thoughts to add to the next episode. Hope you're having a nice day. And remember, if you want to support this podcast, you can share it with friends, leave a review, or sign up to premium content to learn more with each episode. All of the bonus material, all of that premium content, you can find at AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.